range of the enormous, an old snow plough dating back to Victoria, platform ticket machines once so familiar with their brass hands and the names of the railway companies prominently displayed and resplendent in the company colours. And a Nestle's, as we once called it, chocolate machine, which always seemed to work first time, most times. Magnificent examples of royal carriages of the past, so that we can see how Queen Victoria travelled a hundred years ago. The travelling post office back to 1838. This was another British first. And the one at York has all the familiar fixtures and fittings, just like today. Even the now abandoned advanced passenger train has a place amongst the, of the past. But Mallard is one of the most precious relics. Still to this day, round those parts of the British railway system which will allow the use of steam engines. Rob Shawland Ball, deputy keeper of the museum, why she's so important. The future of Mallard is bound up with the future of the whole museum. And our plans over the next four or five years include an expansion of our display space by more than 50%, which will be creating new and exciting interactive hands-on type displays in the Peter Allen building over the road from here, building a new introductory gallery, which we think is very important, which will act as a sort of menu for visitors so that those who know little about railways will have a series of choices to follow through the introductory gallery and into the main displays. This sort of enthusiasm has had its own rewards at York. When it was opened in September 1975, they estimated that they might get 250,000 visitors in the first year. In fact, they got 2 million. Since Mallard first got back into steam, the famous Flying Duck has made a series of outings, and each time the same ritual of starting up the engine must be gone through. It also provides a picture of the deputy keeper shoveling coal. On a modern diesel or electric train, into the cab, push a button, it's a minimum of about four hours to get a steam engine ready from coal. Twelve hours? So, heat it up too quickly, the various metal parts expand at different rates. Before long, you get leaks and distortions of the metal surfaces. So you must gently, the whole engine expands slowly, it spreads from the through the tubes of the boiler and on into the cylinders and valves. Only when the boiler pressure is correct and is nicely warm throughout properly, no chance of damage. A steam raising, as it was, was a drudge, a task given to the young trippers who used to book on at sheds all over the country at two o'clock in the morning to get the engines ready for the men coming on duty at seven o'clock. Sam Foster, British Rail final check on Mallard's front end. Today, getting a steam engine ready is an honour which only a privileged few are allowed to qualify for. The lads 50 years ago would have thought you were mad jested steam raising just for fun. But Mallard today is a star who draws the crowds wherever she goes. When the lighting up process has been completed, the proud locomotive leaves her shed on the way to pick up her train. Today's trip is from Leeds to Scarborough. The crowds are out to give a super send-off to Mallard. Hauling a post office special to show off the work of the travelling post office and the issuing of a new set of stamps, the locomotive carries a special flag. The men on the footplate are ready for a brisk run, though not, I'm afraid, at 126 miles an hour. Mallard today is officially restricted to 60 miles an hour. Although the old loco men say she could still do that famous speed record figure if pushed, without the big end trouble that brought her to a sharp standstill at Peterborough after her great effort. From the air, the train looks like a supermodel layout. This is a living museum with a vengeance. Today, the other star turn is the travelling post office. The system has hardly changed since it was first tried out on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway 150 years ago. 
Let us come in vast sacks into the travelling post office vans, and as the train goes on its way, they're sorted into pigeonholes by town and city. Sorting of the letters while on the move creates a big saving in time, which would otherwise be wasted in some office. Today, special first day covers have been issued to everyone on the train. Mine joins the system and is filed away to hopefully reach its destination. Mallard is on one of its favourite steam runs, heading from York towards the east coast and the sea. It all helps to create a holiday atmosphere, soon to be confirmed, as we arrive at Scarborough, the town that contributed £35,000 towards the cost of the restoration of the great engine. All the cameras and videos are out to record the nameplate which tells the story of 1938. And all the enthusiasts for miles around come to pay tribute. Ironically, this post office trip was supposed to be a secret, but the word soon gets around. Mallard is coming. The local radio and press are there to greet us. And to see us on our way home. What a day out it's been. Lovely old Pullman car coaches, a postal service on board the train, newly designed stamps to put on our cards and letters, and above all, the sight and sound of that great locomotive up in front pounding its way past Kirkham Abbey and Castle Howard and Moulton and Napton on the smooth, flat sections between the Yorkshire Wolds and the North Yorkshire Moors, where Manor gets a chance to show why she was, and always will be, a champion amongst champions. Everyone seems to join in. The endless line of photographers at every vantage point. The startled sheep and cattle who've seen and heard a thousand diesels but dash away in horror at the strange apparition of a steam engine. The railwaymen reminiscing about the good old days. The young enthusiasts to whom the sight and sound of steam is still a novel experience. On the night, on the night, 110, and before I knew it, the needle was at 116. Go on, old girl, I thought, we can do better than this. So I nursed her and shot through the little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, 126 miles per hour. 126, that was the fastest speed a steel locomotive had ever been driven in the world. Mechanically restored and resplendent in its original livery, Mallard is indeed a rhapsody in blue, racing through the countryside in the land where not only were railways invented, but where steam railways reached their highest peak of development half a century ago.